The views expressed are solely those of the speaker and not necessarily those of Paltalk.com, AVM software, or its advertisers. News Talk is online. News Talk online is a production of Peltalk.com, the largest multimedia interactive program on the internet with more than 4 million unique users on demand on iTunes, on demand on YouTube, and now syndicated by CRN Digital Talk Radio to cable systems serving an additional 12 million households. I'm your host, Gary Baumgarten. Well, today, uh, this is a guy who I actually saw for the first time, I believe, on PBS here in the United States. I believe on the Charlie Rose Show. A tremendous man, a tremendous program that he heads. His name is Nicholas Negroponte. <clears throat> he is the founder and the chairman of an organization called One Laptop Per Child, whose goal it is to give a nearly indestructible laptop and by the way I want a, an indestructible laptop but anyways an indestructible laptop to each school child in developing nations now Negroponte is on leave from MIT um, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where he co-founded and directed the MIT Media Laboratory to run the one laptop per child program he started the program because of the nearly two billion children in developing countries who are inadequately educated or who receive no education at all. One in three does not complete the fifth grade. This is an opportunity since you can't take the child to the schoolhouse that doesn't exist to take the schoolhouse to the child. And you can hold these classes anywhere if you get a laptop in the hands of a child. Negropati believes that uh, building school buildings and hiring teachers is not enough, especially in countries where logistics and resources stand in the way of this traditional means of educating. Rather, he believes that by thinking outside of the box, more children can be reached and educated than ever before. Nicholas Negropante, welcome to News Talk Online on Paltalk.com. Thank you very much. Tell me, at what point in your career at MIT did you decide that you needed to walk away from that, and devote your life to this? Well, <clears throat> we started working on things related to One Laptop Per Child, uh, believe it or not, in 1968. Uh, and I really am thinking of the work of a man named Seymour Papert, who started most of the activities in this country that had to do with how children learned and uh, before doing that, he worked with Jean Piaget in Geneva. And when he came here, he, he really tried to understand how children learned using computers, not to be taught, but really the children to teach the computers. And then in the 70s, that turned out to be projects in the United States mostly. In the 80s, we were doing it in developing countries. In the 90s, we were worrying about connectivity and and in the year 2001, we started doing laptop programs uh, in rural and remote villages. So four years ago, I decided to do it full time, but uh, this was cooking for a very long period. And in, and in reality, you have had to face a number of very extreme challenges and you have adapted your technology in order to meet the challenges. For example, some children live in communities where there are monsoons every year or they live in areas where there is uh, a high humidity level or in areas where uh, it's, it's uh, desert conditions where there is sand that could get into the laptops. And in fact, some of the children who are benefiting from this are uh, live in areas where there is no or very limited electricity and very li limited or no connectivity. How did you technologically uh, uh, get around those kinds of barriers? Well, over 50% of the children uh, have no electricity uh, either at school or at home. So uh, 
plugging an AC adapter into the wall isn't even an option. Uh, I, I should say it is an option, but it's not a very frequent one. So we had to uh, certainly build a machine that could be powered by the human body, the upper body, not legs, so you like riding a bicycle, but by cranking or pulling a cord. And also, we had to assume that there was no connectivity and that we would have to bring connectivity to every laptop because we deliver these laptops connected. So connectivity, power were very big deals. And the third and perhaps uh, most spectacular in terms of the solution that was provided is to build a laptop that works in full sunlight as well as indoors as, you know, with a rear-lit display like yours and mine works. So... Uh, the laptop we needed to invent had to be sunlight readable because children will use them as electronic books outdoors as much as indoors. And as you know from using your cell phone or your laptop, using it in a very light room, let alone in the sunlight, is, is basically impossible. You're putting these into the hands of children, so they have to be <laughs> indestructible. They have to be indestructible, and, and, and they also have to have properties that children uh, resonate with and that the children like you know, to use. These are, children are not office workers. They are children. And so if you look, you'll find the laptop devotes a great deal of computation to, uh, to sound, to sound processing. Uh, there's a camera in it for image processing and video capture. There things in this laptop that are there particularly for children and particularly for collaboration where children are talking to other children, children are helping each other, and this is part of connecting children in remote villages. You can't start putting in hotspots or expecting uh, you know, some kind of wired broadband connection. You have to use the laptops themselves to connect to each other and then connect any one of them back to a uh, backbone, typically through a satellite. And even though that satellite may cost as much as $300 a month, if you're dividing it by a 1,000 children, that's 30 cents a month for their connectivity, which is typically affordable. What's uh, really interesting and uh, sometimes disheartening is that you are successful in many cases, uh, Nicholas Negroponte. Uh, who is the founder and chairman of One Laptop Per Child, to get governments to support, heads of state to support the effort. But then when you get down into the nitty-gritty of it, the ministers of education sometimes, because they are in the old mindset of bricks and mortars and school books and teachers, uh, sometimes become resistant. Well, ministries of education around the world uh, have several common properties. Uh, one is that there's typically uh, a very large number of people who work for the Ministry of Education, typically either the biggest or second biggest after the Army uh, in terms of numbers of people 